Oh no, what's going on? Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm thrilled to introduce to you Alessia, who is joining us all the way from Sydney, where she's a PhD candidate at the Institute for Public Policy and Governance. How that connects to architecture, she will explain to us very soon. And she's also an expert member at uh, Stadtnacht, which is a network in urban development and nighttime economy. Uh, her PhD studies uh, are on the nighttime economy of uh, Sydney before and during the pandemic that we are currently living in. Uh, she was working in Italian government, so she knows all about policy making, which is exciting. And she has uh, a master degree in urban planning and policy from the UF University in Venice. So I'm very, very happy to introduce Alessia to you. And I'm excited to know what she's gonna talk to us about. So I will stop sharing my screen, which keeps changing as an epidemic itself. And I will let Alessia take on the floor. Thanks, Vero. This one. Can you see my presentation? Perfect. Um, so thank you very much, Vera, for your kind introductions. Before commencing this lecture, um, I would like to thank Villa Terbo Vera Sacchetti for inviting me today in your Master of Arts in Interior uh, Architecture. I would also like to thank your university, Head Geneve, and express my appreciations for the series of lecture nocturnal uh, perspectives that you are organizing within the research project since the Nuit. When I've learned about the work on the night that you are doing with your students, I was particularly surprised by this new approach, the one in architecture and interior design in the thriving field of the night studies. Today, I'm honored to be here with you and to talk about night governance. Let me start with my motivation for researching about night governance. I worked in the night as a waitress in hospitality for more than 10 years while studying urban planning and policies at Universita U of Di Venezia. Notwithstanding, I've been enjoying some night outs and um, I believe that this has gave me the privilege to understand and appreciate the night and its nuances, the freedom, the escapism, the experimental atmosphere, uh, the controversies, and also the fa fascinating aspects of the night. When I was 19 years old, I became the youngest city councillor in Italian government in a province of 900,000 uh, inhabitants. And all these experiences have shaped my interest on the governance of the urban night, particularly how governments can address issues and potential of the night. The aim of this presentation is to address two questions. What is the impact of nightlife in entertainment precincts? What are the nighttime conflicts arising between different groups in entertainment precincts? To address these questions, I will offer you a motivation why the night a case study for understanding the night governance, which is Zurich, another case study to understand the night governance, which is Sydney. And they will then conclude the presentation with some takeaways and questions for the discussion with you. The first question is why the night? Let's start with this. To answer this question, why the night, I want to read with you some quotes from Murray Melbourne. Murray Melbourne is an American sociologist who published an article about the night as frontier in the American Sociological Review in 1978. He defines the night as a frontier by looking at the extensions of daily activities into the nighttime occurring in the post-industrial society. He was one of the first scholars observing, even though implicitly, 
the rise of different interests, the existence of different groups inhabiting the night, living in the night, engaging in a wide range of activities, providing utilities like electric supply, police patrolling, logistic, broadcasting, airline lending. In his work, Murai Melvin, the night is also explained as a time space. No time, he says, no time has ever been used without also using it in some places. No space has ever been used without also using it some hours of the day. Space and time together form the container of life activity. As you can see from the quotes on the screen, he observes that there is a switch from coordinated actions during the daytime to unconnected actions during the nighttime. There is an evolution into the interest of groups. What are the interests of groups during the nighttime rather than the interest of groups during the daytime? And there is also a, um, um, a search for legislation to decriminalize some sort of informal activities. Let's think, for example, at sex industry or drug, uh, um, drug use for recreational purpose. But which life activity at night are we talking about? As Marion Roberts and Adam Eldridge, leading scholars in nighttime planning, states that there are different lives at night accordingly to different type of uh, activities and different ways of inhabiting the city at night. There are multiple interests, as I've mentioned. Sometimes these interests are oblivions can collide or coexist at the, same to uh, at the same time, according to different ways of inhabiting the city at night. In entertainment districts, for example, residents can complain about noise coming from the street or from night venues. Residents usually complain about litter on the streets, crowds, violence related to alcohol and drugs, and nighttime crime. In entertainment districts, there is a demand for governmental intervention due to the negative impact of nightlife. But also there is a need to decriminalize, as we have seen earlier, some informal activities. There is also need to control uh, over entertainment districts, especially those with high concentration of night venues by posing issues of public service delivery, such as transport at night, mobility at night, the availability of taxis to bring back young, young guys, um, the youth from these uh, districts and other people who enjoy their night, their night out. Street cleaning also, policing the streets, ensuring safety in the public public spaces, minimize harms related to alcohol and drug um, consumptions. Therefore, there is a need of demand, governing the night, but there is also a need of ungoverning the night. Ungoverning means giving freedom and space for working, enjoying the night, enjoying our cities at night, experimenting, experimenting new way of working, new way of enjoying our cultural and social lives in cities at night. Due to the increasing complexity of claims among different groups and within groups around the nighttime in our contemporary cities, as a recent study shows, in the last 20 years, more than 40 cities have adopted a form of night governance. I don't know if you ever uh, heard about night commissions, night mayors, and all these different bodies. Uh, just to give a Swiss examples, I can mention Geneva Bar Association or Le Commission Swiss de Bar et de Club and Bar and Club Commission uh, Zurich. These bodies have also risen for the need to protect the cultural, social, and urban value of our nightlife. In so doing, the night has become an object of public debates among different groups, such as governments, parliamentarian conciliars on one hand, on the other hand, residents, city revelers, but also business owners, night workers, and so on and so forth, health workers, police officers, uh, et cetera. But also the night has become a growing field of research. 
And as such, different type of publications are available. Books, masters and PhD theses, peer reviewed articles in academic journals, governmental and consulting reports. By reviewing all these documents, we can understand that there are different perspectives to study the night. And these are some of them based on different disciplines. Out of this list, apologize, out of this list, I offer four examples. The criminological perspectives focuses on modes of governing the night with the aim to ensure neighborhood safety, minimize harms linked to alcohol and drug consumption in entertainment districts. The urban planning perspectives focuses on the night as a driver for the urban development, increased urban att attractiveness and competitiveness. In so doing, the urban planning disciplines uh, appreciates the impact and the opportunities of the night and study what are the tools to manage, managing the night in our cities. The governance perspectives focuses on the engagement with different urban actors with their needs and claim for the right to the city at night in order to mediate, negotiate solutions and solve nighttime conflicts. The urban design perspectives focuses on lighting at night, placemaking, reactivation of outdoor spaces and how uh, the night and urban space can be uh, co-designed and co-planned with local community. The night has not only been object of academic investigation, but also topic of conversation in international conferences. Two examples are annual conferences occurring in Berlin, and I'm talking about Stadtnachakt International Conference occurred the last um, November. This year, bringing together around the tables practitioners, academics, but also nightlife advocates. The other conference I would like to talk to you about is the International Conference on Night Studies, which took place in Lisbon in the last September and bring academics with their uh, most recent research um, discussing about topics related to the nightlife. Um, now that you, we have appreciated the night as a field of research, as a topic of discussions for its own atmosphere, we can have a metaphorical journal to your neighbor Zurich. Um, let me tell you how everything has started. It was the 2016 and there was an exchange master student at Athens City University at Hamburg. Uh, when I learned about Stadtnachakt, literally translated the city after hours, it was a massive research project, a 10 years research project led by Dr. Jakob Franz Schmidt, an urban planner uh, who engaged with other German urban planners and they studied the urban development of different cities, large, middle, small size cities in German speaking countries. Um, the project was about the culture of going out. So for the first time, the nighttime economy was declined, the nighttime was declined uh, based on the local culture of people going out at night. Um, by engaging with Satnachakt, I decided to conduct a, a master thesis on the nighttime. And here I am talking about the study. Uh, my master thesis was advised by Professor Francesca Gelli, Università U of Di Venezia. I was a master student in urban planning and policies there, and it led to a peer-reviewed publications in an academic journal, the Bollettino, uh, Bollettino della Società Geografica Italiana in 2019. The special issues related to nighttime topics was edited by Luke Giandischi, Marco Maggioli, and Will Stroh, leading scholars in nighttime. My master thesis was also presented in a few international conferences, but I'm not talking about only my master thesis because a few years passed already. I would like to bring some reflections on the ongoing advancement of the field of night governance. Um, so when I started my master thesis, I observed that uh, there was a worldwide phenomenon, the spread of night mayor. Um, that I called at that time night ambassadors. There was a growing interest from local and national governments on the promotion of a vibrant nightlife 
to improve urban attractiveness, address nighttime conflicts like residents versus uh, city revellers, residents versus night businesses, night business versus the local governments. I approached the field in 2016 when night ambassadors were uh, spreading uh, all, ar all around the world and several cities claimed for the recognition of the cultural and economic value of the night, as opposed to a dominant narrative around the night as a terrain of conflict, fear linked to danger, alcohol consumptions and related violence. Back to that time, I used the term night ambassadors deliberately as a generic label to indicate several bodies with different organizations, organizational structures like night lobby, night city councils, clubs and bar commissions, nightlife uh, commissions, advisory boards, and so on and so forth. And based on different constitutive modes from the bottom up or top down by engaging in informal and formal processes of governance on the night. I applied this term because at that time there was no um, distinction between them and there was a lack of identification of what were the urban actors around the night time, who were those who were interested into the night and who were those who were impacted by the negative um, uh, effects of the nightlife. Night ambassadors were attracting interest due to the need to govern the night, that is to promote a vibrant nightlife for economic growth and so on and so forth. The problems that was the role of the, those night ambassadors and how do they contribute to the management, to the, govern, to the governance of the night was poorly understood. There was a research gap basically. Therefore, I focused on Zurich as a case to understand what ways to solve nighttime conflicts in entertainment di districts. Be aware that this is a study uh, back to 2016. Now more research has been conducted on that. Uh, I've also recently published another paper on that while defining these night mayors as an elected mayor uh, representing the night. But let's move forward and let's talk about Zurich. Why I chose Zurich? Zurich was a relevant case study because of three reasons. There were conflicts occurring between residents and nighttime businesses in an entertainment precinct, Langstrasse. The city of Zurich has a clear vision about their nightlife. They knew what they want and they knew what the nightlife was for them. The city of Zurich had a strategic plan in place to govern the night. As you can see from the screen, from an interview that I conducted with this, some representative of the city of Zurich, for them, the nightlife and nighttime economy is relevant for the city. And for them, the night and residential uses are compatible in a neighborhood. So we don't have to choose between um, city revellers who claim for the right to party in a city and the residents who claim for the right to sleep at night in the same city, in the same space. Nightlife, living and partying both in Zurich, was part of the priority setting of the city. Indeed, the strategic plan security in department 2017 intends to position Zurich as bustling city with a diverse nightlife, diverse activities at night, not only alcohol oriented, but also culturally vibrant, socially vibrant. They wanted to tackle nighttime conflicts by seeking for pragmatic solutions. Um, the strategic plan aligned the positions of the city service departments so that a common ground can be developed between different groups around what is night co nighttime conflicts and how they could solve them. And also they wanted to address all stakeholders, stakeholders groups of interest regarding nighttime land use conflicts and strengthen their sense of responsibility. I mentioned about Langstrasse. You probably know Langstrasse better than me. Langstrasse is a former red light district in Zurich with a global appeal. It has been advertised by tourists, tourism websites and magazines as a vibrant, lively neighborhood. 
um, is depicted in tourism media as a thriving entertainment districts in which party there is party and there is life. It is highly relevant for the city to reposition the city in a global context, to be competitive in the world and to let Zurich become a global city. But there was a dispute, as I mentioned, between residents and nighttime owners. The dispute occurred and residents demanding a demanded a governmental interventions. They demanded intervention to solve night conflicts, the problem of noise, the problem of, lit of litter in the streets. They launched the petitions uh, called Massive Disruptions of a Night's Sleep. The unpublished text of this petition letter stressed that there was a monoculture, a monoculture of noisy activities on the streets and courtyards described as sensitive areas for the 24 hour, 365 day trades insisting on them. They, they described the lack of urbanity regarding social density and diversity with consequences on the quality of life. They described the situation of dirt and litter on the streets. Within this dispute, this public dispute, um, a new position has um, arise. Those of night ambassadors, and I'm speaking about bars and club commissions and Nachstadt Rack, the night city council in Zurich. They advocated for the cultural and economic uh, value of their nightlife as a driver for neighborhood attractiveness and urban and community development, as interviews demonstrate. This means that the conflict stems from the opposing visions of Langstrasse as a nightlife neighborhood or as a, as a neighborhood for sleeping. Um, the interviews shows that the, says they, that night, Langstrasse is a pretty place to live and go out at night, while the resident says we have the right to sleep, we, we need to sleep. I want to show you some pictures in the next slides. Um, that clearly shows the conflicts and the, the, the potential, the power of um, local campaigns, both from the resident side and from the night business owners. Um, as you can see from the picture, there is um, translated in English here uh, in, uh, in an area around 150 meters, there are 25 uh, 250 people sleeping. Thanks for your uh, understanding. And also, um, we wish you uh, a good night, exactly like our night, your neighbors. Or um, not important, isn't it? The next toilet, please find the next toilet in the bar at the corner. Cigarettes, beer, chips, and what else? Noise, noise in the street. Thanks for your understanding, your neighbor. On the other hand, while residents were complaining about noise in the streets, night businesses felt a bit under pressure by this uh, demand of control of police and this pressure on the night, nightlife, nightlife districts. So what did it happen is that night businesses and especially bar and club commissions organized a counter campaign by sensibilizing, by sensibilizing residents about what does it mean working at night, what do clubs mean for the neighborhood, and what which kind of solution can be reached by working together. So what I call the night ambassadors place themselves in between, in between the local authority, in between other groups of interest like the police who has the responsibility to uh, 
policing the streets, the residents who are complaining about noise, litter in the street, and so on. What did they do in, in Zurich? As you can see from this um, image representing the participatory process that has been launched by the city of Zurich, through this participation and collab co collaborative processes, nighttime conflicts have been transformed into collaboration, into mutual understanding. Out of this participatory process, different measures have been um, put in place. For example, um, mobile toilet toiletten have been displaced in the neighborhood to help avoiding litter in the street, for example. Um, they developed this sensibilization campaign, like asking the patrons of night venues to please be respectful towards your neighbors. Don't shout, an example is don't shout in the street or be careful, don't throw glasses on the floor and so on and so forth. What they organized is this open day club, which I define like a liminal space for nighttime conflict mediations. Through this open day club, they opened the doors of their clubs, of bars, night venues that are normally usually open during the nighttime to let the residents coming in and understand what is a night venue, what's going on there during the nighttime. It's not about partying, it's not only about enjoying, it's not about drinking alcohol, but it's also about working. During these open day clubs, uh, they organize also some conferences, some moments of discussions and conversation between different groups of interest. And this is what I could define as an informal night governance, where mutual discussion can take place not informal place like the town hall, not informal place like the, the city council, but also in informal space, which are the night venues. Uh, apologize for these slides in Italian. Um, Zurich case shows that uh, the night ambassadors could mobilize knowledge and information through different groups of interest. In fact, they were able to map the needs of the night, the needs and problems around the night to um, address the interests also of nighttime groups of interest. The night governance takes place not only through formal processes, but also through informal processes. Indeed, Zurich showed me that there is a strong communication between these night ambassadors and the local uh, authority through informal chat, through emails, and so on, that we, we cannot see, basically. After talking about Zurich, I would like to show you a bit about Sydney. Um, which in somehow reflects and echoes what happened in, um, in Zurich. Uh, before talking about Sydney nowadays, during COVID-19 and the night during COVID, what the policies around the urban regeneration of the nightlife of Sydney as a global city to be, um, I would like to move a step back into the past because we cannot really appreciate what's going on in Sydney if we don't understand what happened in the past. I would like to talk about the night in entertainment precincts before 2014. And we will understand why, why I say 2014, why I set this date. Let me see if I can open this link so we can. We can watch a video together. Your work can feel. Can you share, can you see my screen? No. No, you, you need to share again. I guess you need to share again just okay. the window of the oh yeah. Yes. Can you see? Okay. Now it works, yes. Much smoother with Monday.com work OS. This smooth. <sighs> All you need to do to get started. 
Sydney's King's Cross is probably the most notorious night spot in Australia, and it's been that way for decades with its mix of music, booze, drugs and sex. But since the death of 18-year-old Thomas Kelly a week ago after he was king hit by a stranger, a lot of people are saying that today the mix is going wrong, with too many bars and too much violence. 7.30's Adam Harvey spent Saturday night in the cross. Sydney's Golden Mile. It's really just a few hundred metres long, a couple of densely packed blocks of bars and nightclubs. And each Friday and Saturday night, it's a magnet for 20,000 people out for a good time. There's a big variety. Something's always happening. Something, there's always entertainment here. But this Saturday night is different. There's police everywhere. You're not worried particularly about um, violence? Uh, a little bit. I mean, it happens a lot. And like some guy just got killed like a week ago. And now there's a lot of cops. But OK, if he didn't die, how many cops would there be tonight? Half the number. My parents are worried, but I'm not. We're not trouble starters, are we? My, I had a very concerned phone call from my mother on the way here, but it seems to be fine as far as we've been so far. <laughs> Early in the night, there's no sense that the cross is out of control. Before midnight, if you're dressed right and you're reasonably sober, you'll get past the bouncers and into places like the World Bar. But as the night wears on, getting inside gets harder. Doors. We've uh, actually got a capacity of 600 people, so we turn over the people maybe twice in the uh, twice or a few more in the night. The World Bar's bouncers knock back about 300 people each night. Often, that's when trouble starts. It's just after 10 p.m. on Saturday. The cross hasn't really got going yet. That'll happen in about two hours. But right here, exactly one week ago, was where Tom Kelly's night began. And exactly one week ago, it's where it ended as well, because a stranger walked up to him and King hit him. His family turned off his life support two days later. Well, I'm coming back to my... I'm coming back to my presentation, but I think the video spoke on its own and it helps out us to understand what were the conflicts in the nighttime in this entertainment precinct, which is King's Cross Spots Point in Sydney before 2014. What happened after a, a huge period of public debate of pressure from the police, health workers who were exasperated by the situation in this neighborhood, lobbied uh, to and ask and demanded for more control and more policing in the neighborhood. There are different perspectives and different stories about what happened and what were the problems in the neighborhoods at night during that time. But what we are sure about is that in 2014, the New South Wales, the state of New South Wales, introduce what are called the local lockout laws. And these laws made Sydney well known internationally for these uh, over-regulations of nightlife districts, especially the area of CBD, which is the pink one that you can see on the screen and King's Cross Spot Point, which is the yellow one. What did these local laws say? Basically, no patrons were allowed to enter in night venues after 1.30 a.m. and no alcohol could be served after 3 a.m. The outcome of this is that if you watch documentaries or if you do interviews or if you read something about King's Cross, you will learn that many people, many young were reversing in the streets and were, um, laying down in the neighborhood without the possibility to go back home because there was a huge problem of public transport and taxi availability during the night time. 
the lockout laws were one of the most divisive nighttime policies in Sydney. The public opinion was totally divided. There were people, groups uh, who were support, supporting the lockout laws because they argue that uh, the situation improved, the neighborhood is more safety, is more safe. Other people argue against the lockout laws and says that the lockout laws literally damaged the international reputation of the city and killed the night life in the city. As an outcome of the local laws, something that was not really expected by anyone, is that there, there was, it has been observed, a displacement of night venues from the areas who were targeted of this, um, were target of these laws through other suburbs, the neighbor suburbs, like in Newtown, you can see here, Kuji, Bondi, Double Bay, and et cetera. As an outcome of the local close, many venue in King, King's Cross, the original um, far west, uh, the night, nightlife far west neighborhood, uh, 270 venue closed and displaced in these neighborhoods. A huge social movement arise by claiming the value, the social cultural value of the nightlife in Sydney. And this movement organized several protests, different parliament parliamentarians supporting these movements. The, and then the discussion entered into the public debate in the parliament and the, the local councils. This is a picture in memory of Sydney nightlife from these protests occurring. And why, why do I explain this? Because the local laws were, were eased in January 2020, just before COVID-19. So all the policies and all the governance initiatives around the night in Sydney need to take into account that the huge damage has been done to the city and to the night in the city. So what they are doing now is trying to survive from COVID-19 like many other cities in the world, trying to recover the night of their cities and also to promote and boost a diverse and safe nightlife. During COVID-19, as a research by um, Nofre and other sociolog sociologists in Spain and Portugal, during COVID-19, the shutdown of night venues has showed the centrality of nightlife for the social and cultural well-being of our society. And um, as many venues, you have been noticed that many theaters have been closed, uh, cinema was shut down, bars and clubs was closed as well. Uh, everybody was afraid that these night venues were the place where the virus could spread because of the social activity, the social gathering of people. So there was quite, the night was quite stigmatized during COVID-19. Um, what happened in Sydney is that new campaigns arise to save and protect live music venues, for example, and this is an example, Save Our Stage New South Wales. These air petitions collected 200,000 uh, signatures. It has brought to the New South Wales Parliament, it has been debated, and thanks to that, New South Wales um, has offered two hundred fifty million dollars to support arts and recreational activities. This is one policy, it's part of um, a trend, part of a, a new atmosphere that Sydney is living, which is that of night regenerations, not only through public findings. Um, like another example of public findings is um, the New South Wales Dine and Discover uh, program uh, where uh, vouchers are available for residents in order to um, go out at night, enjoy a dinner outside, support local businesses and the cultural, um, the cultural scene at night. The night during COVID-19 has also um, become a driver to support the economic recovery. 
Another initiative to support the economic recovery, but also the regeneration of the urban night in Sydney is the New South Wales Alfresco Out of Dining, which is a planning reform for the regulating nighttime businesses, such as bars and restaurants, and allow them to operate, to occupy space and extend their businesses in the public space. We are not talking about only economic recovery and re recovery of nighttime businesses, but as part of this um, atmosphere, these night regeneration policies, the city of T Sydney is also investing in placemaking for reimagining re public spaces at night to allow people the opportunity to go out at night and not only to support businesses who are selling alcohol and who are uh, promoting this culture of alcohol consumptions. This is a photo that I took in Darling Harbour in the heart of Sydney CBD. Um, another idea of place making, which is these reimagining spaces and giving new meaning to urban spaces through, for example, the use of lighting at night or art installations is this one. Um, I would like to give you more details about these art installations. It's part of a City of Sydney program, which is called Art and About. So it's financed by the City of Sydney. It's part of this idea to promote placemaking of spaces at night and reimagine outdoor spaces. The, the artwork is called Intersections and it's by the artist Jan Strange in the suburb of Surrey Hills. It was very nice to walk around there. It's a shame that it occurred only for a couple of weeks, one month maybe. So what? Night governance. The questions of my presentation were, what is the impact of nightlife in entertainment precincts? What are the nighttime conflicts ar arising between different groups? And the two cases of Zurich and Sydney showed that the nightlife has potential to make entertainment precincts, but also not, uh, the night in our city is attractive, competitive, but also lively and vibrant. However, a high concentration of night venues, especially in small precincts like King's Cross, as we have seen, a lack of control may lead to conflicts between residents and night businesses. While some, resi some residents claim for the right to sleep at night, the night businesses claim for the right to work at night, and the city revellers claim for the right to enjoy their night. So how do we solve this? The case of Zurich shows that it's possible to alleviate these conflicts alleviate these tensions by engaging with different groups of interest, communicate and discuss with them, and participate in decision-making policies. I would like to propose a few questions for the discussions, but I would be pleased to answer any question you may have. Um, for example, as you are interior designers and architects, I would like to engage with you in these topics and to understand how can interior design and architecture can promote solutions for preventing nighttime conflicts with a view of the conflicts that we have seen so far. And in your opinion, what are the, night com the, night the nighttime conflicts during COVID-19? If you had the opportunity to go out at night or if you had the opportunity to work at night, Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. Great clappings from our side. Thank you very much, Alicia. I will um, turn off the recording and we can have a more informal conversation. <laughs>